Grace and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The sermon text for us on this Christ the King Sunday is recorded in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 23, verses 2 through 6. In the name of him who loved us to the very end. This is the end. This is the end of another year. Not a calendar year, but a church year. Did you know that? All along we have been following the work of Christ. In Advent he was coming. At Christmas he came. In Epiphany he showed himself by word and deed to be the Son of God. To be our Savior. In Lent we watched as he went out to fight against our greatest and fiercest enemies. To defeat them for us as a king ought to do. We watched as he died for us, as he rose for us, as he ascended back on high for us. We turned our attention as he continued to carry out his work through his church in the season of Pentecost and by the working of his Holy Spirit. And now here, as we look at end times, the culmination of it all, we recognize Christ as our king through it all. It is the end. It is also the end of a series we have been going through called Welcome Home as we have looked to some who have been away for a while and as we turn to them with a smile and with love in our hearts and say welcome, welcome home to the place where Christ is to be found. We come to the last day of that series and we look back on it and we'll continue to welcome people from all over back to the place where we are truly at home. We have done it all with this end, with this goal in mind, to see what it is to be a part of the family of God, not just a family, but also part of his kingdom. We are citizens of the kingdom of our Lord. And what a kingdom that is. And what a king he is. A righteous king, unlike any other. We may not usually think of ourselves as members of a monarchy with a king over us, but the truth is we hold a dual citizenship, one of this world and one of the world above. We are Americans. We don't usually think of having a king. Instead, we have a system that was built from the ground up with three equal branches, with a system of checks and balances. Though not always used perfectly, that has been a blessing to our, our, our nation and our country. Do you know why? When corruption comes, the people are in trouble. And if all of the power is found in one place and that one power becomes corrupt, then the people are in danger. Such as in a monarchy with one king. What if the king is a tyrant? What if he is wicked and cruel? Then the people are doomed. But if the king is just, and if the king is right, and if the king loves the people and looks out for the people, then the people will be blessed. And so, you who have a citizenship in the monarchy, what do you know about your king? If you're worried about the way that things are going in our American country today, I want you to know that it's nothing like what had gone on in the days of Israel and Judah. Wicked kings had come to power, and as I said before, when that one power becomes corrupt, the people suffer. Here in our country, I do not expect the government to be meddling in my religion. We have a separation of church and state of sorts. I do not expect my representatives or the judges or my senators or my president to lead me in my religion. But in the days of Israel and Judah, that was different. The king was supposed to be not just a civil leader, but a religious leader. 
God called them shepherds. But the shepherds had become wicked. They did not care for the flock. They cared only for themselves. It says that they were spiritually scattered. They were lost. If you were to go through the books of First and Second Kings or of Chronicles, you would see a list of many kings there. Many souls were led astray and lost to hell because of many of the names listed there. Because they did not take care of the people, God was going to take care of the kings. He was going to bring them punishment. He was going to scatter the shepherds themselves. And then he himself, our God, would gather the sheep again, give them new shepherds who would tend them and care for them and watch out over them. And the culmination of that prophecy, of course, is in one that we call our good shepherd. You know who that is. It's Jesus Christ. God's kingdom does not have multiple governmental branches it has one branch, a righteous branch. It reads, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up to David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. What does it mean that we call Jesus a branch? Picture is used elsewhere in Scripture. We can go there to find its meaning. In a few places of Isaiah, there the prophet refers to a shoot that will grow out of the stump of Jesse. Jesse was King David's father. So from his family, a, a new growth would come. And that branch, that shoot, would bear fruit. In the book of Zechariah, Chapter 3, there's this vision, this beautiful vision of God cleansing his people, taking off all of their filthy garments and putting on clean clothes for them, and in doing so proclaims that he has taken away their sins and forgiven them. In that context, God says, I am going to send my servant a branch. His work is connected to our forgiveness. Why use that picture? I'll tell you why. Because it looked like the kingdom of Israel had died. Because of the wickedness of their kings, God had expelled them from their land. God had promised to David that there would be a king that would sit on his throne forever. But for over 500 years, there was no king. The kingdom had been chopped down at the very thump. They had no growth. They had no king. How could God then keep his promise? When the angels came to Mary and he told her about this child she would bear, this one called Jesus, the angel said that he will sit on the throne of his father David forever and his kingdom will have no end. A shoot grow out of the seemingly dead stump of Jesse, of the line of David. And he was going to bear fruit. Behold, this branch, it grew. And it came to do God's will. And what do we know about this king? He is righteous. He rules wisely. And he does what is good and just in the land. Do you belong in such a kingdom? Do you deserve to be there? I see people look around at their neighbors, at those who live in other parts of our American country, and they voice their opinions of what they have done with that citizenship. They say that they don't act like Americans. They, they say that they don't deserve the freedoms and the blessings that we have. Americans should be different, should be better than what I see. I sometimes wonder if I really deserve to be in this blessed country. How much more so in the kingdom of God? Who deserves to be there? 
If he is ruling in a way that is just and right, what about me, who in my daily actions often am not just, I am not right, I do what is evil, I do what is wrong, I make my mistakes, I fall. And if the king in this, in this kingdom is just and right, what should he do with the evil and the wicked? What should he do with the one who does not live up to such a kingdom? As we have been saying to each other for these past weeks, welcome home. There may be a feeling in some hearts that this isn't where I belong, that I'm out of place, that there's something about me that doesn't fit. Have you felt that? Have you experienced that? If this kingdom has a just king, what do I do? Will I be driven out and will I be scattered once more? I want you to listen to your king. His kingdom is full of words of peace and comfort, as he says, They will no longer be afraid or terrified, nor will any be missing. Because he tells us that our citizenship and our right to be here is not based on what we do, not on our righteousness, but on his. Let me tell you what kind of king we have. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. Saved from what? This is the primary job of the king, you know, to keep his subjects safe. Safe from what? Another exile? Foreign powers? Corruption of our leaders? More than that. He does not just drive away wicked kings. No, he saves us from ourselves. He saves us from our sins. He save us, saves us from our evil and our unrighteousness and our injustice that lives in our own souls. He saves us from a hell that I know that each and every one of us deserves. And he can do it. Because not only is he from that blessed line of David, a king that comes to sit on this throne from David's family, but his nature shows us even more. He is rightly called the Lord our righteousness. I asked somebody at the door, came to talk to me about their religion once, doesn't believe that Jesus is God. I use these words. Do you see what it calls the branch? Do you know who your king is? He is the Lord. He is God himself. A perfect and mighty king. It is a striking picture, therefore, in what I shared with the children and what we read in the gospel, isn't it? We see Jesus hanging on a cross. And when people talked about him as king, they were not being serious, all except for one. Everything about him they mocked. You say that you are our savior, then... Come down, save yourself, and while you're at it, save us too. You say that God in heaven is your father and that you are his son. Well, then call to your father and see if he answers and treats you like his child. And as the soldiers had dressed him with a purple robe and with a crown of thorns, and they cried out, Hail the king, he did not mean it but tried to barb him in more ways than one. The sign above his head declared him to be the king of the Jews, to which some took issue, in which nobody believed. Kings don't die like common thieves. Sure, he didn't look like the Son of God there. He definitely wasn't treated as one who is righteous. But do you know what was happening there? The sins that make us squirm, he took for himself. Your cruelty and your carelessness, he claimed as his own. 
Everything that should cause us to be cast out of God's kingdom, he drew it all to himself so that the righteous anger of God would be drawn along with it. We sing in some services, cast me not away from your presence. Well, because of our sin laid on him, he was cast away from the love of his father there on that horrible hill. The sin that I committed, he died for. The death I should have died, he died. But in it, a great exchange. His holiness, he who had done nothing wrong, his perfect life, everything that he was, he gave to you. His righteousness. The Bible does not say that his name will be called the Lord our righteous one. As though his righteousness was something to be put up on a shelf and gawked at and admired. He is the Lord our righteousness. You can say Christ is my righteousness. He has covered me in it. He has clothed me in it. He has credited me with it. And that's why I am in his kingdom. And that's why I am blessed to be able to remain in it. And if my place here is dependent not on me, then on him, then if he says so, yes, I do belong in his kingdom. And so do you. This is the end. This is the end to all the worry that will never be good enough for Christ's kingdom because he was good enough for us. It is the end to true danger as I place all of my trust in him. I just want to see Satan and hell try to rip us from his grasp. They cannot have us. It is the end for all that I long for, to be transported out of this world with its temporary kingdoms and countries and to be translated into that kingdom that will never end. It is the end for a search of what this life is really all about and why we are here, for we see it now. He has claimed you to be his own, to live in his kingdom, to serve him in everlasting innocence, righteousness, and blessedness. I have found my purpose because I have found my home because Christ being my king means I've found my family. Welcome to the kingdom. Welcome to the family. Welcome home. Serving Christ our King. Amen.